think of the carnage that would happen. Oh, it's almost certain that there will be a flood of that size uh, again. Floods breed more floods. Once you have a flood, the risk of another one is higher. Absolutely catastrophic conditions. We will have a civil disaster and it will exceed the capacity of the first responders to rescue people. The risk right now of a bigger flood is high. But this wasn't just a rain event, it was a rain emergency. My eyes are fixed on the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment. Beginning though on the Hawkesbury River, it is continuing to rise. There's been a large amount of rain that's fallen here within the last few days. They're only just recovering from the last one. Our TV screens have been dominated by the devastation and loss caused by floods across eastern Australia during the past two years. The Hawkesbury Nepean Valley experienced three major floods in 12 months, but the highest river levels through western Sydney and the loss of life were well below the worst flood on record 155 years ago. Back in 1867, the population of the floodplain was just a few thousand. But that number has now risen to nearly 100,000 people. When the big one arrives, and it's not a case of if, but when, it could easily be Australia's worst ever flood disaster. In June 1867, the affected area was described as an inland sea, stretching for more than 30 kilometres. Even though the population at that time was small, more than 30 people lost their lives. Almost 500 homes had to be evacuated. Houses weren't just flooded, they were swept away. And most of Emu Plains was underwater. I'm standing here on the Nepean River right near the Great Western Highway. And just 15 kilometres upstream is a full Warragamba Dam. In 1867, the water level would have risen 10 metres above my head. And downstream at Windsor, it would have risen 18 metres above my head. But critically, six metres above the level we saw in March this year. Rob, you've been working on this for quite some time. What are the chances of seeing that record flood again? We are guaranteed to see a record flood at some point in the Hawkesbury Nepean system. The question is when. Uh, the chances at the moment are the highest they have been for decades. What sort of things have you been looking for when forecasting something like this major flood event? First of all, dams need to be full like we've got at the moment. Secondly, uh, the catchments also need to be quite wet to enhance that flood risk. And also, uh, the kind of weather system we're most worried about is an east coast low. That's where you get your heavy rain, your wild winds, and on the coast you see big waves as well. So that's the kind of event that I'm most worried about. 90% of major floods in the Hawkesbury have occurred between February and September. Why are you so confident that we can expect to see that third La Nina eventuating? It's to do with the Interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, or the IPO index. Essentially, it looks at the whole of the Pacific Ocean rather than a small little portion like we look at for La Nina and El Nino events. So with the IPO index, since 1900, there have been 11 times when the IPO index has remained below minus one through the autumn. And at the moment, it's well below minus one. In all 11 of those occasions, we've had a La Nina event in the following spring and summer. Even if La Nina doesn't officially develop, the IPO itself tips the scales in favor of wetter than usual weather. From now until September, there is a high risk. Then, because we're likely to still have a very wet catchment at the start of next year, the flood risk will be much higher than usual for the next East Coast low season from February to September next year. The Hawkesbury Nepean catchment has been described as having the highest flood exposure in New South Wales, if not Australia. That's due to topography, a growing population, evacuation challenges and low flood awareness. The catchment is also huge, covering 21,000 square kilometres, stretching from Goulburn in the south, west past the Blue Mountains beyond Lithgow, all the way up to nearly Singleton in the Hunter. The main rivers which feed the Hawkesbury Nepean include the Wallandilly from the southern Tablelands, the Coxus River from the central Tablelands, and the McDonald and Kola rivers from the north. 
the expansive network of the catchment means rain falling 200 kilometres away ends up flowing through the narrow Hawkesbury Nepean gorges. We know flooding will happen again, and it could happen soon. A topic we'll cover in more detail later on in the series. If the 1867 flood occurred today, the SES determined in 2017 that around 90,000 people would need to be evacuated. 12,000 homes would be inundated and the damage bill would reach $5 billion. Here at Sky News Weather, we have investigated additional reports and these are the results. Close to 4,000 homes would become unlivable. Close to 40,000 people would need temporary accommodation, some for up to a year. The Hawkesbury Electrical Substation and possibly the Penrith Substation would be flooded and badly damaged, meaning up to 50,000 non-flooded properties would be without power for up to three months. Two hospitals would need to rely entirely on emergency generators, while raw sewage would flow into the river for months. The team here at Sky News Weather believe this is a story that needs to be told. In coming reports, we will detail the potential impact of a record Hawkesbury Nepean flood including the fatal flaws in evacuation routes, the planned mitigation construction of a 14 metre extension to Warragamba Dam, the plan to double the population living on the floodplain in the next 30 years, and the people desperately trying to get out. In our next report to the communities of Western Sydney, who have now lived through three major flood events in just 12 months. Sky News reporter Lucy Polkinghorn will talk to locals about their experience in the flood zone and the desperate struggle to relocate before the big one arrives. I broke down quite a number of times after last year's flood and this year I'm barely even able to hold it together. We've got families that are interrupted on multiple levels with you know not being able to go back to business and uh, a lot of residents walking in saying I just can't do this again. So we're seeing quite a lot of um, fairly intense trauma. Um, we're hearing from our mental health services that you know the, the demand for those services is significantly higher than even the last flood that in part two of the series. And remember, for the latest weather information and emergencies, keep watching Sky News Weather on Channel 601. Coming this flood water will certainly rise. Came up hard and fast. Parents had great concerns for their children's safety. Completed last May, it was designed to be flood proof. Last year we saw the bridges come up, but no, nothing like this. We've lived here now for 15 years. Never ever flooded like this before. We're more worried about if, uh, if we run out of food. I broke down quite a number of times after last year's flood. Uh, this year, I'm barely even able to hold it together. Welcome to part two of Underwater, a series of special reports from the Sky News weather team on the impact of a record 1867 flood along the Hawkesbury Nepean River today. When the big one arrives, it could be Australia's worst ever flood disaster. In this episode, we hear from the Western Sydney communities who have now lived through three major floods since early 2021. Many in the flood zones have been stretched to and beyond their physical and mental limit. And that's after a level of devastation well below what would eventuate following a repeat of 1867. Here is Lucy Polkinghorne with more. The sun was finally shining when I travelled to Windsor, but the signs of recent flooding were everywhere, especially under our feet, which felt like walking on a giant sponge. Peppercorn is a community service provider. One of their main responsibilities is offering flood recovery support and running the Disaster Recovery Centre. Their team, led by Helen Colagiri, includes nurses and healthcare workers who are right there on the front lines talking directly to those most affected. At the moment, because of mould, um, we've got families that are interrupted on multiple levels with you know not being able to go back to business. And uh, a lot of residents walking in just saying, I just can't do this again. Um, really, really quite overwhelmed with how much work they've got to done. Um, they've worked to rebuild um, just before the flood and they've just seen a lot of that loss yet again. So we're seeing quite a lot of um, fairly intense trauma. Um, we're hearing from our mental health services that you know the, the demand for those services is significantly higher than even the last flood. Only just last week we had a caravan park owner came in and said, you know, I had to rebuild, you know, 40 odd uh, cabins and suites and things. Can't do it again. It was just so much work. I wasn't even finished the last time. Um, and to have lost it all, that's that's not even just the financial impact. That's the psychological impact. It's the physical of walking 
coming in every day and seeing what, what was there is now not, not there again. It's really tough. Helen talked of devastating circumstances the community had to endure and continue to live through. Elderly and physically impaired individuals having to evacuate alone. Incidences of people turning up to the recovery centre in a state of shock, not even knowing what to ask for because their farms were underwater, their equipment rendered irreparable and their homes uninhabitable. Financially struggling families having to cook their daily meals in local parks. Most of these people were too traumatised to tell me their story themselves. Could you opt to put your house on the market and would you even be able to sell it? Is that another concern? Yeah, well we're already seeing from the March 21 flood, 2021 flood was that um, a lot of properties down in the flood prone areas are actually on the market, still on the market uh, and for sale. Um, you quite often see the shell of a house that's been gutted and now is on the market as a, as a you know, acreage lot um, not being able to sell. So obviously insurance is a huge, huge issue for anyone who's on the floodplain. We're hearing a lot of those concerns is that um, maybe insured in the March 2021 flood, but am I insured for the second flood or how did my insurance pan out with all of that? Um, because, you know, $35,000 for insurance on, a, on an acreage property is, is just not a viable thing for the majority of people. I was going to say, how many people and particularly clients that you deal with can actually afford to have the insurance? Yeah, look, not, not many that we hear of the occasional business owner or, or someone who, who's been able to afford that. Um, and again, then it's the, the, even the process, if you may be even covered by insurance, do you actually necessarily want to go through the rebuilding process is really a bit of a challenge. Um, but yeah, for the majority of people, they can't afford it and they're living in dwellings that are, are not insured, um, not appropriately insured if they are insured. And uh, you know, even when we talk about flooding being in high risk, high you know river lying areas, but we've got a lot of families in and around you know South Windsor, uh, where they're in low lying areas that have been impacted and weren't anticipating ever having a flood at their own property. So taking them off guard, um, didn't actually realise they were living in a floodplain. So even that whole notion, I didn't even know I needed to have flood insurance. Um, they're learning, unfortunately, the hard way. That was Lucy Polkinghorn. In our next report, we examine the inadequate evacuation routes mapped out for flood-threatened Hawkesbury communities. Sky News reporter Henrietta Moore travels the very routes planned to take people to safety and discovers they would themselves be underwater well before evacuation orders are issued. So, so don't trust the government to deliver a flood evacuation access and emergency access route. It's been talked about, but it's not coming. We can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. There'll be dire consequences if we do not get this fixed properly. But it's the state of it that is the problem. It is, um, it's far too narrow, it's not well uh, marked, it's not marked at all. In fact, there's no line, line markings, no, no centre line, no edge lines. For your up-to-date weather report, stay tuned on Channel 601. For this and future reports on the Hawkesbury, you can head to the Sky News Weather website. Evacuation orders remain in place for several parts of New South Wales and more rain is expected throughout the weekend. After the worst flooding since 1988. It is the 10th flood death in New South Wales this year. A number of roads cut off as a result of flash flooding. Over 2,000 people are affected by the floods. 23 orders are in place, including 16 warnings. Close to 55,000 requests for assistance. Welcome to part three of Underwater, a series of special reports from the Sky News weather team on the impact of a record 1867 flood along the Hawkesbury Nepean River today. When the big one arrives, it could be Australia's worst ever flood disaster. In this episode, we investigate the potential catastrophe of inadequate evacuation routes. The SES's priority during a flood emergency is firstly to protect people from danger, then secondly, to protect property from damage. For three decades, government studies have been conducted to identify risk factors in the valley to prevent the loss of life and property if an extreme flood should occur. All studies costing tens of millions of dollars have come to the same conclusion. Something needs to be done. But since the 1990s, the only major construction was the Windsor Bridge, and that's been flooded three times in the past two years. A 2017 report by Infrastructure New South Wales identified issues with the road network for evacuation. It's been five years since that report. 
Sky News reporter Henrietta Moore travelled to Pitt Town near Windsor to see firsthand the state of evacuation routes and what progress has been made. Fifteen years ago, a major housing development occurred in the small suburb of Pitt Town, increasing the population from 300 to 3,000. I'm told this community are angry due to the state of the roads they are forced to use during even minor flooding. People whose houses are flooded, they accept that. They know that they are in a flood area and everyone pitches in and helps them. But they're now they're angry. They're very angry because they don't trust the government to deliver a flood evacuation access and emergency access route. It's been talked about, but it's not coming. We can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Today, we're one day closer to the next big flood. I met with Vince Rayfield, who bought land and built a home in the new estate 10 years ago. We drove the current evacuation route on a dry, sunny day, but Vince has had to drive it when the conditions were wet, muddy and dark. What is the most dangerous thing about this escape road? And the road we're on right now was under at least four or five metres of water. Narrow roads that, are, that we're driving on right now become heavily congested because the volume of traffic significantly increases due to the fact that the main roads in and out of Pitt Town are cut by either local, local flooding um, or riverine flooding, river rising, or a combination of the two. So when most of those access roads cut, we have to use the so-called flood evacuation route as the only road in and out of town. Um, but it's the state of it that is the problem. It is, um, it's far too narrow, it's not well uh, marked, it's not marked at all. There's no edges on it. It's, it's it, during a time of, of wet weather, there's heavy, typically heavy rainfall, potholes, heavy traffic. Large vehicles that don't normally go on that road are now f are then forced to use that road. So um, large uh, fuel tankers, um, water tankers, um, uh, petrol and all other services have to be uh, trucked in, garbage services to and from. So there's a large number of, um, of heavy vehicle traffic increase. And a combination of those things just chops the, the road to pieces in no time. Well, frankly, it's downright dangerous. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. What worries you in a worst case scenario? Anything that blocks that, blocks that road will prevent uh, safe exit of traffic going out and it'll prevent safety uh, emergency vehicles coming in. So my, my fear is that, that um, people's lives are at risk and at worst case could be lost um, because that flood evacuation route is simply inadequate. And it's not just during the floods that these roads are damaged. A thousand uh, heavy vehicles go through Pitt Town every day, taking from sand and other building materials to major infrastructure projects all over Sydney. Um, those vehicles have to go right through the middle of town, through several intersections, past uh, school children, people with disabilities, roads with, with no uh, footpaths on them and it was the state government's responsibility to collect the contributions and to apply those contributions to the infrastructure and they simply haven't done so. I then met with Peter Ryan who is the president of Pitt Town Progress. His family has been here since 1840 and worked on Hawkesbury Farms for five generations. With his children and grandchildren also living in Pitt Town, his passion for the community is clear. If the government was able to buy back the land, is it an option to leave? No, I'm not leaving. I've been here for too long. We're passionate about our town. We love our town. This is our history. And there's that connection, that connection to the people, to the farms, to the river, to everything. And that is something that Pitt Town really has. Will fixing the roads really help? Fixing the roads, I can tell you right now, will save lives. If order will tell you to get out, it won't tell you to go and get your horse or your cow or your caravan or your tractor. It will tell you, you will leave now and it's only for humans to leave. We must all leave Pitt Town along the one road. Um, we go down into the potholes because we can't go anywhere else. It's dangerous. There's no drainage, the water's coming across the road. All we need is a tree to fall on it or a collision. We won't be able to get emergency services into Pitt Town and we won't be able to get people out and then we'll all be put, our lives will be in danger. This is our lifeline when the floods are up. The state government has put us in, the pos in this position where they put all these extra people in here and they're shirking their responsibility, their duty of care to give us a safe, reliable, well-maintained, well-designed flood evacuation route.
As you have heard, many of the critical roads are cut off by flooding before the areas being evacuated are actually underwater. And the emergency section of the road started to fail within three hours. In the next part of this series on the Hawkesbury Nepean flooding, we will look into mitigation options to reduce the flood risk from raising Warragamba Dam to improving infrastructure or moving people out of the flood zone. For now, all your up-to-date weather reports, keep watching Channel 601. For this and past reports on the special Hawkesbury series, you can head to the Sky News Weather website. spilled over for the first time since 2016. And there's been two decades or more of argy-bargy about whether to increase the height of the Warragamba Dam by another 14 metres. It absolutely needs to happen. That would hold 1,000 gigalitres of water back in a flood event. It claims water needed to be released from Warragamba Dam ahead of a severe rain event. This has been done, the work's been done. Now yeah. is the time for action. Welcome to part four of Underwater, a special report on the impact of a record flood along the Hawkesbury Nepean River. In our first three reports, we investigated the catastrophe which would unfold during a worst case scenario. In this episode, we look into mitigation. Every time it floods, a debate reignites on what should have been done, what is being done now, and plans for the future. While there are many options, and the debate has been raging since the 1990s, the issue remains unresolved. So what are the options? The team here at Sky News Weather spoke to several experts in water quality, water treatment, water supply. The people advising local and federal government on water management decisions. We started off by asking if Warragamba Dam was built as a flood mitigation dam. No, it's not. It wasn't built as a flood mitigation dam, was never intended to be a flood mitigation dam, and is not operated as a flood mitigation dam. It's, it's purely a drinking water supply dam, so we let that water fill right to the brim when we can so that we maximise our water supply security and we keep it as full as we possibly can all the time. So what's stored in Warragamba Dam at the moment is probably about five years of drinking water supply, and, and in a wet season, that's a very, very high level of water security to have. Unlike other cities like Brisbane, where their main drinking water supply, Lake Wyvernhoe, is 50% used for drinking water supply and then 50% of air space sitting on top of that for when those big floods come along and that's their flood mitigation capacity. So there's really no engineering change that you need, just an operational change uh, to make sure that you're releasing water earlier. Under the current protocol for the dam, Water New South Wales cannot legally undertake pre-releases. Small releases are made when the dam is at full supply, but only to one metre. Many support the idea of a slow release in times of flooding. When levels drop in the dam and the dam is refilling, the point at which we start to let that spill, instead of letting it fill, should be lower. And the realistic lower full supply level is 14 metres below the current full supply level, which frees up about 40% of the capacity of Warragamba Dam to keep as airspace to use for flood mitigation when those big floods arrive. Ian, what is your opinion on a slow release? That creates so many other problems downstream. If you do that over a short period of time, just that slow release could be enough to cause flood and to put people's life and property at danger downstream. If the slow release plan were to go ahead and Sydney goes into drought, where else would we get water from? Supplies such as seawater desalination, recycling, uh, even urban, urban stormwater harvesting, making more use of rainwater tanks. There are lots of things that we can do uh, that will take our reliance off Warragamba Dam and there are real advantages for doing that in terms of drought security. Desalination plants are very reliable. They'll supply water day in, day out, whether there's a, a drought or a flood. That's not the case for Warragamba Dam. Uh, so Warragamba Dam you know, has been at risk of being unable to supply drinking water at periods of severe drought. Uh, and so spreading the risk by diversifying drinking water sources makes a lot of sense. What if we let that water go and then we have a severe drought, as we did from 2017 to 2020, and we were in big trouble? We were the only city in Australia with water restrictions, capital city in Australia with water restrictions 
The cost of the water, it's considerable in terms of money. So in one day this year, on the 20th of March, that was one of the big days that nearly the equivalent amount of water that Sydney uses every year was spilled over Warragamba Dam spillway. It was about 450 billion litres. The salination plant at Kurnell that produces 250 megalitres a day of drinking water would have taken Kurnell five years to produce that. That in financial cost to Sydney Water is about $1 billion worth of water. But the cost is also, if we went into another drought and that flood water didn't come, that could be the water that keeps Sydney going for one year. And this is the thing, we go from drought to flood and we have to do each of them in mind with the others. Um, Sydney dodged an absolute bullet when it actually started raining because our water supply was now below 50%. Kernel only supplies about 15 to 20% of our daily supply. So if it kept going down, what were we going to do? And it is, you know, the water supply is like the artery for life in Sydney and we are a burgeoning, booming economy. Um, we need to look after that, but we also need to look after life and property in Western Sydney from flood. One proposed strategy is building a 14 metre extension to the current dam height. A higher dam would store a portion of the flood water and perhaps delay the flood peak. The concern is in the very highest floods uh, that that uh, will uh, not uh, prevent major loss of life and damage, but will in the meantime have lulled people into a false sense of security, uh, will have enabled further development on the floodplain. The wall's going to take a long time to build, so what should we do right now? I think there's a whole series of things we can do right away. Um, one of which is, I think we need to seriously stop selling real estate that is so flood prone. And we should stop selling real estate that people can't afford to insure. The biggest thing would be to listen to the civil defence authorities, SES, police, ambulance, all the first responders. We need to learn the lessons of uh, Lismore. The authorities could not get people out. Floodwaters, when they get going in a flood, can rise so quickly. We need to remember that the New South Wales government has this crazy plan to allow another 130,000 people uh, to build homes on the floodplain. Now that is simply madness. There are further complications with raising the height of the dam. The UN's World Heritage Committee asked Australia to submit an environmental statement of raising the dam wall. The committee has stated this action would lower the universal value of the Blue Mountains, including damaging Aboriginal cultural heritage sites. We run up against a number of challenges with raising the Warragamba Dam Wall, which makes me question whether it's even a realistic proposal. If we're going to find ourselves uh, in breach of uh, international agreements around uh, the, the declarations of national parks and world heritage, I think that we need to be realistic about it and we need to be looking at things that we can achieve and we can do them in a realistic period of time. The state government had been considered a, a planning policy to restrict house building in places that were uh, at risk from severe fires and floods. Uh, the planning minister has stopped uh, those rules uh, to enable uh, more uh, development including redevelopment of houses that have been damaged. And uh, now is not the time to be rebuilding in harm's way. Yet another option put forward by the Insurance Council of Australia in 2021 is to buy back flood-prone land rather than spending money on building a higher wall. There are numerous viewpoints and ideas, but still no action. And now the added pressure of a looming third La Nina, as we outlined in part one of this series. To view the full underwater series, head to our website. And remember, for the most complete coverage of weather events in Australia, keep watching Sky News Weather on Channel 601.